Um, we will turn to our first panel of witnesses, and I want to welcome the attendance of each here this morning. I'll say a brief word of introduction. Mr. Paul Schieber is Vice President for Access and Roaming for Sprint. Mr. Robert Irving is Senior Vice President and General Counsel for Leap Wireless. Mr. Victor Mina is President of Cellular South. Mr. Ravi Portalanka is Chief Operating Officer for Fiber Tower. Mr. Chris Murray is Senior Counsel for Consumers Union. And Dr. George Ford is Chief Economist of the Phoenix Center. We welcome each of our witnesses this morning and thank you for sharing your views with us. Without objection, your prepared written statement will be made a part of our record and we would now welcome your oral summaries and ask that you keep those summaries to approximately five minutes so that we have ample time for questions. Mr. Schieber, we'll be happy to begin with you. And if you would turn your microphone on, we'll hear you better. And you do need to turn your microphone on. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Boucher, Congressman Stearns, and members of the subcommittee. I'm Paul Schieber, Vice President, Access and Roaming at Sprint Nextel Corporation. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about competition in the wireless industry in the United States. For years, Sprint has been a leader in the development and deployment of data services, including a 3G mobile broadband platform throughout most of its network, as well as the development of 4G technology. In recent years, Sprint has spent billions of dollars to deploy its 3G eVideo network, improve its performance capabilities, and increase the array of advanced services that are available to consumers through its mobile broadband platform. Through our investment in Clearwire, we are also committed to maintaining our leadership role in making 4G broadband services widely available to U.S. consumers and businesses. These mobile broadband services will undoubtedly fuel significant economic development and job growth. Unfortunately, there continue to be several impediments to Sprint and other wireless and wireline provider efforts to make broadband services ubiquitously accessible and reasonably priced for all Americans. In Sprint's view, the biggest of these impediments is the failed special access market. But I want the members of the subcommittee to know that Sprint is also supportive of efforts to reform the nation's cell siting laws. We need laws which make it easier for wireless carriers to co-locate facilities and to ensure timely approval of cell site construction. I focus my testimony on special access reform, however, because Sprint believes that should be a top priority of the FCC and this subcommittee. Special access is the lifeblood of the telecommunications industry. It touches virtually every communications product and is a critical part of the services consumers use every day. When consumers make wireless calls, access the internet, send emails, swipe their credit cards at stores, or use automated teller machines, they are using services that rely on special access. The importance of middle, middle mile facilities to the wider deployment of broadband was underscored by Susan Crawford, a member of President Obama's National Economic Council, who recently stated, and I quote, investments in backhaul or middle mile networks particularly in rural communities, will likely be particularly useful. When Sprint and other carriers provide mobile broadband services, we need other providers to link together into a seamless network our facilities. In the simplest configuration, a broadband provider must interconnect three segments of an end-to-end -end service, a local network, middle mile facilities, and a backbone network. In Sprint's case, its local wireless broadband facilities connect a caller or a laptop user to a nearby cell site. Sprint then needs middle mile transmission circuits to transport the customer's traffic from the Sprint cell site to a mobile telephone switching office and from there to Sprint's internet backbone network. As has been repeatedly demonstrated by Sprint and other wireless and wireline broadband service providers, as well as by reports issued by the GAO and the National Regulatory Research Institute, we are overwhelmingly dependent on special access facilities provided by incumbent LECs. Despite the central role of special access in mobile and fixed broadband deployment and the benefits that would come from robust competition, incumbents control 91.7% of the special access market and two dominant carriers 
AT&T and Verizon alone receive 81 percent of all special access revenues nationwide, generating a rate of return of up to 138 percent on these revenues in the case of AT&T. This is obviously not a competitive market. The monthly payments for middle mile special access Sprint incurs in its wireless business represents about one third of the cost of operating a cell site. In most cases, Sprint simply has no competitive alternatives to the incumbent LEC for these facilities. Today, Sprint buys access from vendors other than the LEC at only 4% of its cell sites. The excessive prices that incumbent LECs charge for these middle mile connections harm consumers, cost us jobs, and divert needed resources from Sprint's broadband network and services. Fortunately, the FCC has the legal authority and the evidentiary record to fix the problem and spur broadband deployment. Reform of special access will promote mobile and fixed broadband growth by freeing resources that can be used to invest in new facilities, create new jobs, and contribute to the nation's economic recovery. I respectfully ask this sub subcommittee to urge the FCC to act now. The special access rulemaking now pending more than six years must be completed now to rein in anti-competitive special access prices and practices by incumbent LEX, allowing Sprint and other competitive providers to accelerate the deployment of mobile and fixed broadband. Stimulating broadband deployment in this way will generate economic growth and expand consumer access to broadband communications, and it will do so without spending a dime of taxpayers' money. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Schieber. Mr. Irving. Chairman Boucher. Ranking Member Stearns. And if you could pull that microphone a bit closer, it would be helpful sure to us. Thank you. And members of the subcommittee, thank you for allowing, us to, allowing me to testify today on behalf of Leap Wireless and its subsidiary, Cricket Communications. I would also like to thank you and the Congress for your leadership in appropriating stimulus funds to, exp to expand broadband services and to improve access to broadband by, bu by public safety agencies. While you are addressing many important issues today, I would like to offer Cricket's perspective on one of them, the importance of automatic voice and data roaming to ensure effective competition in the wireless industry. First, I would like to note for you where Cricket fits in the industry and briefly explain why small and mid-sized carriers like Cricket promote innovation and competition. Cricket and its joint venture partners have built digital networks covering almost 84 million individuals in 32 states, and we're continuing to grow steadily. In fact, we will launch service in Washington, D.C. and Baltimore in the next several months. Cricket services are specifically tailored to bring wireless communication to consumers who have, left be who have been left behind by other providers. We offer consumers unlimited voice and data wireless services for a flat monthly rate, with no fixed term contracts, no credit check, and no early termination fees. We also recently introduced an affordable wireless broadband product at $35 to $40 per month for, unlim for unlimited service. Our, cricket, our customer base reflects our commitment to the underserved. A majority of our customers are Hispanics, African Americans, and other minorities, and our customers tend to be younger and less affluent than, the, than our competitors' customers. We recently, profit, we recently partnered with the nonprofit group One Economy to provide very low-income families in Portland, Oregon with computers, modems, and free Cricket wireless broadband for two years. This pilot program has been tremendously successful in promoting broadband access and in, and in increasing the internet savvy of program participants. One partic participant reported to us that he's now enrolled in an online English class. Another said that she now uses emails to apply for jobs. Cricket hopes to expand this program to reach other very low-income families who can, who can benefit from affordable broadband service. Our growth and our commitment to a diverse customer base illustrate the type of competition that Congress and the FCC have tried to promote. And our success demonstrates that innovative pro-consumer benefits that small and mid-sized carriers bring to the wireless marketplace. We show that being pro-consumer can be good for business. We discipline, we discipline prices in every market that we enter, and our, and our presence prompts other carriers to offer a wide range of choices, including flat rate, unlimited usage plans, like the plans we pioneered. 
In recent years, we have been concerned with the increasing consolidation in the, of spectrum and market share into the hands of the nation's largest carriers and the consequence of this trend for small and mid-sized carriers and, more importantly, for consumers. Cricket and other small, rural, and regional carriers increasingly face anti-competitive business practices, such as the largest carrier's refusal to provide wholesale roaming on reasonable, non-discriminatory rates and terms. Automatic roaming agreements play a critical role in the wireless industry. They plug coverage holes that exist in every carrier's network. Reliable service is not simply a marketing tool. Whether we're trying to get emergency text message alerts, seek help if we have car trouble, or contact family members in the wake of a hurricane or terrorist attack, consumers should not suffer dropped calls when they travel away from home. Unfortunately, the nation's largest carriers have institutionalized policies of charging very high wholesale rates or denying roaming services altogether to other carriers' customers in areas where the requesting customer can theoretically provide service. These behaviors weaken emerging competitors' service offerings. In spite of the fact that the largest carriers themselves have relied on roaming agreements for over 30 years to expand their own networks and to improve service. These anti-competitive practices harm all consumers by reducing competition, but they disproportionately burden disadvantaged and rural populations, many of whom cannot afford or qualify for wi wireless service provided by the nation's largest carriers. In my written testimony, I have described several proceedings in which the FCC has an opportunity to improve its current policies with regard to automatic roaming. I urge Congress to monitor these proceedings closely, to encourage the FCC to adopt pro-consumer, pro-competitive approach to roaming, and if necessary, to consider legislative solutions that ensure all consumers have access to affordable nationwide wireless coverage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Irving. Mr. Mina. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for allowing this opportunity to testify before you today. I've been in the wireless industry for over 20 years with Cellular South, the nation's largest privately held wireless carrier serving all of Mississippi and four other uh, uh, southeastern states. In my years in the wireless industry, I've seen the duopolistic world of the early cellular licenses when there were two and only two carriers in each market. The rise of wireless competition as a result of the later spectrum auctions and the growth and in innovation throughout the industry as a result of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. However, today I'm convinced that unless things change quickly, the industry is coming full circle and progressing, or rather regressing, into a duopoly once again. Today, AT&T Wireless and Verizon Wireless have almost 65% of the national market. Over 90% of the wireless market is in the hands of those two plus uh, Sprint and T-Mobile. This, this should come as no surprise after the parade of acquisitions over the past several years. One of the, uh, one of the, market, one of the effects of, the market concentration, uh, of this market concentration is that the largest carriers now use their market power to demand and receive long-term exclusive agreements with device manufacturers for the latest and greatest te technological handsets. Exclusivity agreements prevent other carriers from acquiring these devices and are particularly harmful to wireless, to wireless consumers. The practice has worked so well for the large carriers that they are now using the same formula for the, emergence, the emerging netbook market as well. What would happen if merchants sold computers that, that only worked with one internet, internet service provider? For example, imagine a world in which Macintosh computers only worked on AT&T DSL. That, of course, is exactly the world we live in with the iPhone and Apple's exclusivity agreement with AT&T Wireless. If a consumer wants that handheld computer, he or she must subscribe to that service through AT&T. This battle among the industry titans has left consumers as collateral damage because device manufacturers are prohibited from offering cutting-edge devices to the smaller carriers who many times serve rural areas. Even in areas that are served by the largest carriers, consumers are not free to choose the latest devices without being forced into accepting services from a specific carrier. If you live in New York City and want an iPhone, then you're obligated to be an AT&T wireless customer. If you live in Washington, D.C. and want a BlackBerry Storm, 
then you, you will be a, you'll be a Verizon wireless customer whether you want to or not. The situation with exclusivity agreements is bad and only getting worse. Sailor South and customers like us have tried to find solutions to this problem without resorting to help from policymakers. We have attempted several solutions within the industry, including direct talks with device manufacturers, industry association working groups, and consolidating purchasing power through buying groups. But all these efforts have been fruitless. Without legislation from Congress or action from the FCC, there will be no solution to this issue. On the topic of roaming, far and away the most important issue is that of automatic roaming for, for data services, specifically roaming for broadband. When I began in this industry, roaming agreements could be negotiated in a matter of an afternoon and usually finalized within a week. Today, the largest carriers use their market power to dictate unreasonable roaming terms or they refuse uh, data roaming agreements altogether. 700 megahertz licensees, not named AT&T or Verizon, cannot build out their net next generation networks without high speed data roaming agreements. This is increasingly important as, Sater, as, as carriers deploy new data technologies that provide services anywhere, anytime, such as telemedicine applications and voice services over internet protocol, so somewhat better known as VoIP. I ask you, is VoIP, is VoIP voice roaming or is it data roaming? Better yet, why should it matter? We are at a, cri we are at a critical period in the wireless industry. Although the wireless industry may lo no longer be in its infancy, it is, no more, I mean, it is no more mature than an awkward adolescent. There is much innovating left to be done. There are many people of all socioeconomic backgrounds and geographic locales who have yet to benefit fully from the wireless experience. Before it is too late, Congress must step in and put an end to the largest carrier's anti-competitive stranglehold on devices, as well as ensure full roaming access. The future of free markets in our industry and the delivery of wireless broadband services to rural America depends on it. A light regulatory touch today will prevent the re-emerging duopoly in which two companies control all the customers, all the best devices, all the prime spectrum, and become too big to fail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mina. Mr. Portolanco. Good morning, Chairman Barter, Ranking Member Stearns, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity today to testify about the importance of middle and last mile backhaul services in the context of competition in the wireless industry. My name is Ravi Potolank and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Fiber Tower Corporation. Formed in 2000, Fiber Tower is the nation's leading alternative carrier for middle and last mile backhaul. Fiber Tower operates hybrid fiber microwave networks in 13 U.S. markets. The top eight mobile carriers and the government are amongst our largest customers. We have national scope 24 gigahertz and 38 gigahertz spectrum licenses and access to our 100,000 towers. We also offer fixed wireless services across the nation. We've been offering backhaul services for the last six years and are in a position to offer a unique perspective. Let me explain. Backhaul connects last mile end users, including those that serve first responders, homeland security, municipal buildings, medical facilities, schools, and libraries to the internet and to other network switching centers. Absent backhaul infrastructure, broadband networks cannot operate. Also, backhaul and transport infrastructure must be built before end users can fully realize the benefits of broadband. In fact, backhaul is often considered the Achilles heel to achieving broadband connectivity. This lack of development in unserved and underserved areas has inhibited the growth of broadband services. Our modular network is relatively inexpensive to deploy when compared to fiber and can often be up and running in a matter of days. I want to applaud the subcommittee on its leadership in producing the broadband stimulus programs. The subcommittee and the committee identified middle mile and last mile backhaul appropriately as a critical piece in achieving broadband expansion. We see the access to this capital as a unique opportunity to catalyze the expansion. For example, we could build in the western half of Virginia backhaul networks similar to those that have been built elsewhere. In just months, we could get people working throughout the unserved and unser underserved communities and make broadband accessible. This will create long-term jobs while permanently enhancing the economy. This model can most definitely be deployed in other areas of the nation. I would now like to draw your attention to four important matters. First, mapping of unserved and underserved areas must include middle and last mile backhaul. 
the FCC, NTIA, and RUS should consider an area without adequate backhaul or transport coverage as underserved, even if such an area has an end-user broadband service provider. An area without backhaul is unable to support multiple broadband networks that drive the economy. Second, ensure that multiple-use backhaul platforms, which are called muni frames, are accessible to all end-users identified in the legislation. Doing this truly brings broadband to the area while greatly reducing costs. It is important to ensure that all parties have the ability to access these platforms in a non-discriminatory manner. Third, reinforce the existing federal preemptions or burdensome zoning and permitting restrictions for fixed wireless antenna placements. Restrictions that impair the installation of small antennas for fixed wireless are not permitted under a very specific FCC ruling. Zoning and permitting requirements often add substantial delays and costs to deployments. Fourth, make a limited number of the numerous vacant TV white space channels available for point-to-point -point licensing. The recently completed FCC TV white spaces order is the first step in unleashing broadband deployments to unserved and underserved areas. The lack of backhaul and transport services is particularly problematic in rural areas where great costs and great distances slow or prevent connections to switch locations of the internet. However, white space channels make long-range propagation possible thereby reducing the number of required towers to reach the same distance. There is no member of this Congress more committed than you, Mr. Chairman, to bringing high-speed broadband to America. I submit to you today that should FCC grant point-to-point -point licensed use for a limited number of TV white space channels, it could stimulate rural broadband. This proposal involves a small number of numerous vacant rural channels and only in a fashion that protects incumbents and promotes plentiful and healthy, sustained growth for unlicensed devices. A 100-mile connection using white spaces would typically cost less than $200,000 to deploy, while the same connection using some proposed bands, like in 6 or 3.65 gigahertz spectrum, would likely cost more than $3 million, almost 15 times as much. Similarly, a new trenched fiber built in the same distance would normally cost at least 20 or 30 times more expensive and be slow to deploy. In conclusion, making a limited number of TV white space channels available for before the initial stimulus grant filing deadlines is very critical. Finally, we strongly recommend the following. Continued reinforcement of FCC rules that preempt burdensome zoning and permitting restrictions for small fixed wireless antennas, comprehensive mapping of middle mile and last mile backhaul, and an express eligibility for backhaul and transport projects under the BTOP and RUS programs. This now concludes my oral testimony, and I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Mr. Portolanka. Mr. Murray. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Uh, Ranking Member, and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you once again on behalf of consumers and on behalf of Consumers Union, the, the publisher of Consumer Reports magazine. Um, I'm pleased to report that this year, the satisfaction of consumers in the cell phone industry does seem to be headed upwards. You may remember last year it was bottom of the barrel, it was 18th out of 20 services that we rate, um, but this year it seems to be moving closer to average and we're happy about that. Fewer consumers are complaining about uh, automatic contract extension and fewer consumers are uh, complaining about early termination penalties as vociferously, although we still believe that because these fees are starting from a very high level, uh, we agree with state courts they're finding they may be illegal, so we think that scrutiny is warranted. But we have a new top concern of consumers this year, and that is the high price of cell phone service. And you may recall the last time I was here, I, I said that U.S. consumers pay more than consumers around the world for cell phone service. Now, on a per minute basis, as the industry is quick to note, uh, because U.S. consumers talk an awful lot, uh, we pay a little bit less, but if you look at just the dollars, the amount of money that people spend every year, U.S. consumers spend more on cell phone service than, about, than in any other industrialized nation. Um, we also see that SMS text revenues are up for the carriers over 150 percent per texting subscriber, and that's not overall over the whole network, that's just for the people who text, it's up 150 percent over the last four years. We see this year the, the rage is consumer overcharges for data plans, and uh, w we see one subscriber, uh, I had a, an account of somebody who bought a, a netbook and got a, a data plan from AT&T. Five gigabytes is what she got for $60. 
She exceeded that plan by five gigabytes, and guess what the bill came back? $5,000. It's astonishing to me that the first five gigabytes somehow cost $60, and then the second five gigabytes cost about as much as a pretty decent used car. So what's going on here? I saw a McKinsey report that was fascinating, which basically said this industry is moving very quickly towards duopoly, or towards a quasi-duopoly. Um, and that concerns us. Basically, in sum, what I would like to say is that if we want competition to work better in this market, and I believe it can, is this market more competitive than some of the other rather monopolistic sectors of telecom? Well, yes, but that's sort of like saying uh, a horse and buggy is a much better way to get around than a unicycle. We can do better than that. Um, so if we want competition, we need to reduce switching costs for consumers. That includes things like number portability, allowing consumers to take their phone numbers with them. We uh, initially, when we first started talking about this four years ago, the cell phone industry said this is going to cost billions of dollars and nobody wants it and nobody will use it. Well, that wasn't the truth. The truth was people use this every day. They've been very happy with it. And it, didn't, it not only didn't cost so much, but it has actually allowed some carriers to really win in the marketplace. So the FCC is considering a proposal to reduce the interval from four days to one. We obviously support that, and we hope that uh, the agency will recognize the arguments of the carriers as uh, relatively transparent protectionism. The other thing, if we want uh, competition, switching costs need to come down, and early termination fees are still a major concern for us. Um, I'll note that we are talking about a national model, but we do have a national model in the Uniform Commercial Code, which is the law in 50 states. And what that says is that if you want to charge subscribers for actual damages, that's okay. But if you're charging them a penalty that's designed to prevent them from switching, that's illegal, right? The law of contract says, you can't do that because we want competition to work as vigorously as possible. So now the cell phone companies are up here saying, we want a national model exempt us from the law of contracts in 50 states. I hope that the Congress will not go for that opportunity. Um, as we look at a national model, we have to look at what's the price of preemption. Um, if we think that we can put in very strong national consumer standards, it's not totally anathema to consumers, but I do worry when I hear members of Congress saying, uh, discussing how little this industry needs oversight, and then in the next breath talking about a national consumer protection model. That seems to me to be code for we're going to eliminate some strong consumer protections in states. Um, the last thing I want to briefly touch on, I, I apologize I don't have time to talk about roaming and data roaming and special access, but I'm very concerned about any competitive behavior I see in the industry, and I really would beg this committee for more oversight. Recently, we saw uh, AT&T saying they would not allow Skype to be used by users on the 3G radio. They'll allow you to use it on Wi-Fi, but you can't use it on the 3G radio. And the, the top public policy executive for AT&T says, we absolutely expect our vendors not to facilitate the services of our competitors. This is the internet. It's supposed to be different. This is what's supposed to bring us competition. And if what we're saying is, we're just going to treat all these internet companies as competitors, and we're not going to let them use our internet connections, well, we have fundamentally broken the internet. So I'm not st stepping up today saying, regulate the internet. What I'm saying is, let's get some oversight. When we have clear examples of anti-competitive behavior, we need action. The, the last thing I'll say is, um, on access to consumer devices, handset exclusivities, I'll note that um, Ranking Member Barton has a, a bill which aims to eliminate exclusives for automotive diagnostic software in an industry which is arguably more competitive than this one. And I think that that's good because you're breaking the stranglehold of automotive dealers and allowing smaller uh, repair shops to get in on a game that would otherwise be a complete monopoly for the dealerships. Well, similarly here, we have some carriers who are absolutely too small to have the market power to get the devices that consumers are demanding. And if we want 3G to be built out in rural areas, I'm telling you, we have to look at this problem. So I thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you today, and I, I hope that we can uh, engage in further oversight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Murray. Dr. Ford. Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Stearns and members of the subcommittee, good morning and thank you for the invitation. My name is Dr. George Ford. I am the Chief Economist of the Phoenix Center, a nonprofit 501c3 organization that focuses on the publishing of academic quality research on the law and economics of telecommunications in high-tech industries. 
Our research is consistently targeted at providing policymakers information about the important role that pro-entry policies must play in the communications industry. Our substantial research production has been published in academic journals, and several of our papers cover many of the topics discussed in this hearing today. The Phoenix Center makes it a policy not to endorse or support any particular piece of federal or state legislation or proposed regulation. Our mission is not to tell policymakers what to think, but more how to think about it. By most accounts, the wireless industry today is workably competitive. The statistics have been cited here today by many members of the subcommittee and many of the panelists. But it is not perfectly competitive. No industry is. Workably competitive means that competitive, competitiveness is effective enough at sustaining good performance, even if not matching the textbook concept of perfect competition. Regulation is unlikely to improve market performance in a workably competitive market. Nor is, the, the, nor is the industry static, but it is constantly changing. The dynamic nature of the industry requires constant reformulation and testing of pricing plans, product offerings, and network capabilities. Some changes are successful, some not. That's the nature of the business. You mentioned earlier, Mr. Chairman, that most uh, Americans have access to four or so wireless carriers, and some feel that this makes it a concentrated market, and by some definitions it would. But the relatively concentrated nature of wireless communications is, a, is natural and to be expected, given the large amounts of capital expenditures required to participate in the industry. The industry incurs about $20 billion in capital expenditures annually. Economics teaches us that in industries with such large capital cost relative to retail expenditures, only a relatively few number of firms will be able to survive and continue to offer service. The industry structure is for the most part preordained by its cost and demand structure. While it is often assumed that observing that there are only a few firms implies that there is little competition, there is no unambiguous theoretical support for this position. Duopoly is not a dirty word. In the 1992 Cable Act, rate regulation was abandoned with the presence of one and a half firms, and that was in the statute. Okay, that's an HHI of 8,600, according to the rules. I do not mean to imply that industry concentration is irrelevant, but it must be placed in the correct context. Recognizing that the industry is driven by its underlying cost and demand conditions is vital for good policymaking. Let me give you a few examples. Take spectrum caps. Contrary to widely held beliefs, it is not possible to increase the sustainable number of firms in the wireless industry by increasing the amount of spectrum. Whether there are two or ten firms, the cost to deploy and upgrade a wireless network is roughly the same. Dividing the market into smaller pieces by divvying up spectrum into smaller pieces will not increase the number of carriers that can survive. What it will do is cause a non-sustainable industry structure and inevitably result in mergers bankruptcies or both. On the other hand, in a world of limited spectrum, having a few firms may actually be a very good thing for society. The more spectrum a firm has, the higher bandwidth services it can offer. If we cut the spectrum into little pieces to make more firms, we might get a little more price competition for low bandwidth services, but we lose the enormous value offered by higher bandwidth innovative services like mobile broadband. There's a trade-off between lots of guys with a little and a few guys with a lot. My research has also shown that given the relatively concentrated nature of telecommunications markets, regulators must be very careful not to exacerbate the factors that generate that outcome. However well-intentioned, regulatory-driven open access or wireless card phone proposals do exactly that. They both are likely to spark further industry concentration and increase prices for mobile handsets without necessarily benefiting consumers. There could be some benefits to such proposals, but all regulation comes at a cost, and my research leads me to believe that the costs are, out likely, or are likely to outweigh the benefits. Uh, in a recent paper, using auction results uh, uh, show that uh, Carter phone style open access obligations could reduce industry profitability by 32% and reduce uh, industry investment by $50 billion over the next 10 years. This large reduction in profitability could literally mean the difference between the survival uh, or demise of weaker wireless providers. 
open access regulations would, in fact, reduce the number of carriers in the industry and possibly result in significantly less competition and choice for consumers. Moreover, regulations that control handset equipment, a common feature of wireless card or phone policies, invariably leads to higher handset prices, but not necessarily lower service prices. And many of the people who propose these rules recognize this outcome, but ignore its implications. This would not be good for the average American, not the high user American, but the average American, and would be particularly harmful with those with low incomes who are prolific users of mobile technology and are more likely to be cord cutters. Another feature of the wire, wireless industry that's typically forgotten, is that for me? Uh, no, that, no, that's <laughs> actually policy for debates, us. Uh, uh, please, is that it's a multi-product industry. You, you are getting near the end okay. of the time. All right, so I'll finish up. Uh, the typical wireless carrier offers local calling, national calling, international calling, email, text messaging, picture messaging. They'll even fix your uh, flat tire. Uh, the economic implications of this are important. A wireless firm doesn't offer a price and a service. It offers a set of prices and a set of services. All these services are interrelated. The price of one goes up, the price of the other goes down. The quantity of one goes up, the price of the other ones may change. You cannot take one thing, text messaging or phones, and focus on that one thing and say, oh, there's market power in this market. Because a high price in one service may sustain a low price in the other service. We're not in here talking about restaurants who mark up wine three or four times and give you water and bread, okay? But it's the same kind of argument that people are making. Finally, Dr. we have Ford, a paper you're here. about two minutes beyond okay. your time. All right. We have a, a paper here that we recently uh, uh, published on the national uh, framework for, for wireless regulation. What's a little different about our approach is that we're not, we, we allowed the state regulator to make efficient decisions for its people. It is acting in, its, in the interest of its people. It is not acting incompetently or anything like that. But even still, it makes sense. If those decisions in one state spill over into another, whether it be cost or prices, that the regulation move up to the national level. So it's not a debate about the competence of regulation. It's a debate about how the industry and how a particular regulation in one location could impact another. Thank and you very much, Dr. Ford. Thank you for, thank you for your time.